Welcome to the Russian Rulers History Podcast, Episode 97, The Berlin Wall and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Last time, we recounted Khrushchev's trip to America, the downing of the U-2 spy plane with the controversy that surrounded it, and Nikita's embarrassing behavior at the United Nations. There is one thing I've failed to mention in previous podcasts on Khrushchev, and that's one that I'm going to rectify right now and it's his fanatic persecution of religion, a pogrom far more vigorous than even under Stalin. There was a revival of religion that was necessary during World War II to rally the people, but with the war over, it wasn't needed by the communists and was viewed as a threat to their authority, especially by Nikita Khrushchev. As Jeffrey Hosking put it in his book, Russia and the Russians, A History, Quote, between 1958 and 1964, the Russian Orthodox Church lost some 40% of its parishes and about three-quarters of its monasteries. Closures were especially frequent in Western territories and in regions occupied by the Germans during the war. Other denominations heavily hit by the campaign included the Armenian Apostolic Church, the Adventists and the Baptists, while the Jews lost about a third of their synagogues and the Muslims more than a fifth of their mosques. Unregistered groups like the Pentecostals, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the various true Orthodox congregations were banned outright. Now, when Khrushchev returned to Moscow in late October 1960, he was confronted with an internal crisis, an agricultural one. Even though he was warned repeatedly that his virgin lands program was a colossal mistake, he believed he was right and his beliefs were bolstered by the first two harvests in 1958 and 59, which were excellent. The 1960 harvest over all of Russia, and in particular the virgin lands, was the worst since Stalin's times, and this was due to some terrific drought conditions. Now, one of the reasons for the failures was Khrushchev's insistence on following the crackpot theories of one Trofim Lysenko. And listener Dave, this one's for you. We do mention the man. Well, as Taubman described the pseudoscientist, quote, born into a peasant family, the barefoot scientist, as he was called in the 1927 Pravda article that helped launch his career, professed to have solved problems that plagued Soviet agriculture how to enrich the soil without fertilizers or minerals, how to protect wheat by vernalizing it, i.e. by soaking and chilling the seed before planting it, and how to cross-breed wheat rather than plant the pure varieties recommended by specialists, by having peasants march through the fields using scissors and tweezers to open up self-pollinating self -pollinating spikelets to wind-driven cross-pollination. Lysenko also claimed to have disproved the genetic theory of inheritance and, contra Darwin, to have altered the basic nature of plants and animals by changing environmental conditions. Now, when even his own family members tried to convince Nikita that Lysenko was a quack, his son Sergei remembers, quote, The conversation really angered father. He never shouted at his family, never cursed, or raised his voice. But this time he flared up and in a raised voice repeated his old arguments that unscrupulous people were using us for their own purposes and that we, ignorant in this manner, were echoing their words. Finally, he lost his temper altogether and declared that he wouldn't tolerate carriers of an alien ideology in his own home and that if we persisted, we'd better not darken his door again. Now, the real problems which plagued the Soviet Union was the lack of incentive for any increased production and a real lack of equipment and supplies to harvest the fields. By March 31, 1961, Khrushchev proposed a 15-point program to revitalize the agricultural system, but instead of trying to fix the fundamental problems, he relied on miracles based on quack science supplied by Lysenko and his minions. The other problem vexing Khrushchev was the German issue. As his son puts it, he had nightmares about it. The German problem gave him no peace. 
Instead, it kept slipping out of his hands. More and more of the best workers in East Germany crossed the border to the West, which severely hurt the GDR's economy. Khrushchev needed to find a way to get the United States back to the negotiating table, but America was in the midst of a presidential campaign between Vice President Nixon and John F. Kennedy. When Khrushchev learned of Kennedy's victory, he proposed pre-inauguration meetings, which Kennedy had to reject. After he was sworn into office, he repeatedly delayed formal meetings, although he admitted that they were inevitable. U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union Thompson warned Kennedy and his advisors in March of 1961 that if deals were not made resolving the Berlin issue, he could foresee a wall being erected. My old Russian history professor, Dr. Paul Average, had told us in class that in the Pentagon War Games room where he once worked, the scenario where the GDR, backed by the Soviet Union, would build a wall in Berlin was rejected as ludicrous. There would be one more scenario in relation to the USSR, he said, would also be rejected. But I'm getting ahead of myself. By mid-April, Khrushchev met with American news writer Walter Lippmann at his Pitsunda Dacha. Nikita told him that the Soviet Union had to sign a peace treaty with the GDR and acknowledged that it would cause problems. I don't want tension. I know it will create tension. I want to avoid it. But in the end, I've got to do it, said Khrushchev. After Lippmann warned him that it could cause the Western powers to declare war, the Soviet premier said, There are no such stupid statesmen in the West who would unleash a war in which hundreds of millions would perish just because we sign a peace treaty with the GDR. There are no such idiots, or they have not yet been born. When Lippmann then suggested that a five-year moratorium on the Berlin issue be tried, Khrushchev responded by saying, as his guest remembered it, The matter could not go beyond the fall or winter of this year. He reminded me that the original plan had been to act within six months. Thirty months have now passed. Now, not everything was going bad for Nikita, as on April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first man to make it into outer space. This gave Khrushchev an immense sense of pride. To top it off, at the same time of this Soviet success, the Americans made a massive mistake known as the failed Bay of Pigs invasion disaster when the U.S. backed an invasion of Cuba by expatriates, but inexplicably refused air support, which caused the destruction of the force and gave a black eye to both the United States and the Kennedy administration. At first, Khrushchev was furious, but after thinking things through, he became elated as he realized that Kennedy was greatly weakened. Now was the right time for a summit. On May 12th, Khrushchev accepted the invitation for a June summit in Vienna. Kennedy, in a very surprising move right after that announcement, gave a second State of the Union speech in which he asked for higher military spending, hoping to bolster the U.S. position. Now, in preparation for the summit, advisors to Kennedy warned him not to be intimidated by Khrushchev's brutish style. The two-day meeting was held on June 3rd and 4th. Day one saw Khrushchev topping Kennedy over and over. As he saw it, what can I tell you? This man is very inexperienced, even immature. Compared to him, Eisenhower was a man of intelligence and vision. Day two saw Kennedy go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Soviet premier. Philosophical debates, which Kennedy's advisors warned him not to get into, went on nonetheless. Kennedy lectured Khrushchev as if he were a schoolboy, which infuriated Nikita. The two-day summit did little to quell the tensions between the two superpowers. As Kennedy remembered it, I never met a man like this. I talked about how a nuclear exchange could kill 70 million people in 10 minutes, and he looked at me as if to say, so what? Khrushchev, on his return to Moscow, summoned John McCloy to his dacha in Pitsunda. McCloy was Kennedy's chief armament negotiator, and after all the saber-rattling the president was doing back in the U.S., 
which Nikita viewed as a preliminary declaration of war, the premier had to stand up to it. He told McCloy, Please tell your president we accept his ultimatum and its terms and will respond in kind. We will meet war with war. I am commander-in-chief, and if war begins, I will give the orders to the troops. He then threatened that if war started, Kennedy would be, quote, the last president of the United States. Khrushchev truly believed that Kennedy could be pushed around, and to up the ante one more step, he reneged on an agreement to stop nuclear bomb testing. He presented his findings to a group of Soviet scientists, one of whom was Andrei Sakharov, who bravely spoke up against further testing. Khrushchev went ballistic. As he put it, Leave politics to us. We're specialists. We have to conduct our policies from a position of strength. Our opponents don't understand any other language. Look, we helped elect Kennedy last year. Then we met with him in Vienna, a meeting that it could have been a turning point. But what does he say? Don't ask me for too much. Don't put me in a bind. If I make too many concessions, I'll be turned out of office. Quite a guy. He comes to a meeting but can't perform. What the hell do we need a guy like that for? Why waste time talking to him? Sakharov, don't try to tell me what to do or how to behave. We understand politics. I'd be a jellyfish and not chairman of the Council of Ministers if I listened to people like Sakharov. Those ministers around Khrushchev were stunned, and his policies were making more and more of his friends concerned and opposed to what he was doing, although quietly. The military people were even more dismayed, as all the saber-rattling would have to be backed up with action if the U.S. called them on it, and frankly, the Soviet Union was way, way behind the Americans in military might. As Marshal Sergei Varensov said to Colonel Oleg Penkovsky, with respect to ICBMs, we still don't have a damn thing. Everything is only on paper, and there is nothing in actual existence. Penkovsky turned out to be an American secret agent, so the comments were quickly in the hands of the CIA and the White House. Things were about to get trickier for Khrushchev. The East German government was now in a panic as tens of thousands of their citizens were pouring over the border every month because of the Soviets' blustering. Something had to be done. On August 13, 1961, the border surrounding West Berlin was sealed and the construction of the wall, first with barbed wire, was begun. The world waited with bated breath to see what Kennedy's response would be. The first stage of barbed wire being put up was a test to see if the West would acquiesce to their actions. Kennedy did nothing, as he promised to protect West Berlin, not all of the city. The mortar part of the wall could now be erected. As Nikita's son remembered, father was delighted. By establishing control over its borders, he thought the GDR had achieved even more than it could have from a peace treaty. Others saw it differently. Troyanovsky thought that the wall, quote, saved Khrushchev's face, but it was a silent recognition that he had not achieved his basic aim to force the Western powers into a compromise favorable to East Germany. What the Berlin Wall incident caused was Khrushchev believing that he could push Kennedy around even more, resulting in a crisis that brought the world closer to thermonuclear war than any other moment in history, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, when I, remember when I said that before my professor said there were two scenarios regarding the USSR that was rejected by the war games room. One was the building of the Berlin Wall, and the second was the idea that the Soviets would build missile sites on Cuba. In Russia, while all of this was going on during 1961, News was good on the home front, but changes were in the air. Agriculturally, the harvest was looking like they were going to rebound from the previous two bad years. Industrial production was up, and the Soviet space program was going on quite well. As Khrushchev put it, we are living, comrades, you and I, at a happy time, when the most cherished dreams of the finest sons of mankind are being fully 
realized. He felt that socialism was about to reach its zenith and that a fully realized utopian society was now within reach. He felt, along with some of his advisors, that the completion of Lenin's dream would come about by the year 1980, and now was the time to begin to break down the societal and governmental barriers to it. Glossy pictures of Soviet superiority to the U.S. was put into countless commission reports and propaganda spread throughout the media. They began to promise much, despite being warned to the contrary. It was at this point that the anathema to communism was being crushed, as I mentioned earlier, with the closing of churches and monasteries and the arrests of priests. At the 22nd Congress, convened on October 17, 1961, Khrushchev was at the height of his power, just at the moment where those under him began to seriously doubt his policies. Nikita dominated the Congress to a degree that even Stalin had not attempted. He gave numerous speeches and read many of the reports, to the point where years later, a Khrushchev detractor, Dmitry Polyansky, complained that a party of 10 million couldn't find one other person in its ranks to give one of these reports. This Congress was, as Pyotr Demichev said, was Nikita Sergeyevich's time in the sun. The sun was now beginning its descent. Another issue brought up at the 22nd Congress was Stalin and his legacy. At the beginning of the Congress, the late leader's body lay next to Lenin. Then, a motion was made on the next to last day of the Congress to recognize as, quote, unsuitable the continued retention in the mausoleum of the sarcophagus with J. V. Stalin's coffin. That night, Stalin's coffin was removed, dumped into a pit, and covered with truckloads of cement. As Schleppen remembered the event, they didn't carry it out horizontally, but at a 45-degree angle. I had the feeling that he was going to open his eyes and say, What are you doing to me, you bastards? Kaganovich, Molotov, Malenkov, and the others from the anti-party group, who had already been sent to godforsaken outposts in the past, were now removed and stripped of any and all privileges they had and were completely removed from the Communist Party. Khrushchev was now at the top of his power, or so he thought. He had hand-picked the Presidium members we believed were solidly in his camp. How wrong he would be proved to be. After the Congress, changes were being implemented to shift the economy, especially agriculturally, which was to bring great consternation to the people of the Soviet Union. On June 1, 1962, price increases for food products were announced to help bolster production. The people of the cities and industrial towns were furious. Riots broke out with public discontent levels not seen in decades. One demonstration in Novocherkask was reminiscent of the Bloody Sunday demonstration in January of 1905. But instead of pictures of Tsar Nicholas II and Orthodox saints being at the head of the column of people, pictures of Lenin, Marx, and Engels were leading the pack. As had happened in 1905, many died that day after being shot at by KGB and police. Over 30 died. Many more were wounded. The government so wanted to cover this up that the streets were repaved at night to cover up the blood and body parts that they couldn't wash away. As the fervor of anger over the price increases began to diminish, liberal ideas began to crop up all over the Soviet Union. One book by Alexander Solzhenitsyn became the symbol of the short-lived liberal movement. The book, which I heartily recommend, is a Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, a work which gives the reader a true deep insight into the life of a person who was being imprisoned in one of Stalin's work camps for a crime, being a German spy, which was not true. Khrushchev loved the book. Conservatives hated it. By October of 1962, things seemingly were going great with reforms occurring left and right. 
but all was to change in the blink of an eye. On October 14, 1962, a U-2 spy plane flew over Cuba and took pictures which showed that the Soviet Union was building launch sites for missiles that could threaten American cities. When President Kennedy was informed, his comment was, we're probably going to have to bomb them. The president's advisors were stunned by the news, with no one being more vocal than his brother, Robert Kennedy, who cursed the Russians in very salty language. There were two options in front of Kennedy. One was airstrikes against the sites, but that one might incite the Soviets to attack Berlin and try to seize the city, making the European allies question Washington's strategy. If he ordered a blockade of the item of the island, Moscow might order the same around Berlin. What to do? What to do? Khrushchev, on the other hand, was attempting a bold gamble that he hoped would strengthen his hand both domestically and internationally. There were growing grumblings in Moscow, especially amongst the military elite, over Nikita's handling of affairs. He had to support his communist brother, Fidel Castro, in Cuba, as the Caribbean leader feared another attempt by the Americans to storm his island and depose him. There were American forces on the island at Guantanamo Naval Base, so it seemed to him that the next attack, after the failed debacle of the Bay of Pigs invasion, would include American Marines. Khrushchev asked his defense minister, Molinovsky, how long he estimated that the Cuban forces could hold off the Americans. The reply was days. Of course, Khrushchev and Castro were right in their fears of an invasion. The Pentagon was planning different types of covert operations to assassinate Castro, invade the island, and an invasion planned to occur somewhere around October of 1962. Nikita needed to act and act boldly. But how? Earlier that year, it was decided that the Soviets would help Cuba by building missile launch sites to both protect the island and to threaten the Americans, much like the Americans threatened the Soviet Union with missile sites in Turkey and Italy with their Jupiter-class missiles. Join me next time when I cover the full extent of the crisis in Cuba, along with the beginning of the end of the reign of Nikita Khrushchev as the head of the Soviet Union. Next time. Let me redefine what next time means. Over the past two plus years, I've attempted to make sure that I got a podcast out pretty much every week. Well, I'm sorry to say that won't be possible anymore. In the next couple of weeks, I'll be starting a new position as the president and CEO of a company that will be building medical labs around the world. And that's going to put a serious cramp in the time I have to be able to devote to this podcast. See, I'm not going to allow the quality of the material to suffer. So I'll be going into an every other week schedule. But I will also be doing my overdrive podcasts on those weeks when I don't have a scripted podcast to record. I will continue with the so Sino-Soviet dispute over uh, the borders and Mao's problems with Khrushchev from Khrushchev's memoirs, as well as his opinion of the policies of the people who succeeded him. Another series I have planned will take us back in time to Catherine the Great's memoirs of her early days in Russia. Then I will go even deeper into the past by reading passages from the primary chronicles, which go back to the first Rurikind rulers of Kiev. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to look us up on Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast page, where you can ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. So now, as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.